Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Um, and I hope we all survive post-lunch. I'll try not to fall asleep up here. Um, it'll be tough, though. That was good. So I, I named this talk and then threw the picture up there and realized I should have called it Enrich Your Data. It really pulls the room together. Um, and so I'll change it. But I had already put it in the program, so I had to live with it. As Phil mentioned, my name is Pete DiGiorgio. I'm the Vice President Federal at Security Onion Solutions. Uh, I am a re retired Army cyber officer. Um, flew Army helicopters for a little while, grew up, got a real job, and started cybering. And really, really enjoyed it. Uh, so today we're going to talk about data enrichment. Uh, now I said enrich your life, and I probably should start with you know, namaste, greetings, kombucha, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk about life enrichment and how wonderful it can be. I won't keep that tone because we'll all be asleep and happy. Uh, and I'm, I, I hope to uh, pass on some information, maybe uh, generate some thought, and we'll see what the community does with it from here. So let's get going. All right, so uh, really simple talk. So uh, I do want to chat about situational understanding and decision making. That's why we do this. Um, well, this by... I mean, that's why we talk about information security, because something's happening. We need to understand it, and we need to describe it to someone to make a decision. So we'll talk about that for a bit, because it ties into what data enrichment is at a uh, somewhat academic level. I did a little research for this. And then we'll, we'll get into some engineering, because, you know, nerding is fun. All right, so my favorite, knowing is half the battle. Uh, the other half is red lasers and blue lasers, um, pew pew. So uh, back from my old army days, we used to talk about this concept of know yourself, know your terrain, and know your adversary. That's how we would organize data or information in a tactical operations center to drive decisions for the commander. Um, where are we? Where's the bad guy? What's in between us? How do we gain the advantage so we win? Uh, and so as I transitioned into information security operations, that always resonated with me. So I share it as much as I can share it because uh, it might help you. Now all of that, those three simple statements, really trace themselves back to some text from Sun Tzu, the ancient military uh, philosopher. I won't read the whole thing, but that's essentially what Sun Tzu was getting after. Um, you know, if you, if you really know yourself, and if you really know the terrain, you can think through how to gain an advantage. And then if you know the heaven and earth, obviously your victory is complete. But that takes a lot to know all that. So how do we pull that all together? For decision making, uh, this concept is something from the Air Force. Uh, I believe it was Colonel John Boyer created this for fighter pilots. So it's called the OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, and act. And the faster you can process this loop, the faster you can make decisions. And if you can do it faster than the other person, you win. So those two concepts in, in the military are usually shared fairly often. So with data enrichment, you really get to the bottom of the circle. So how do we orient and decide? We kind of know observe, right? You have to collect the information. You have to put it someplace. But when you're staring at that information, how am I orienting on what's important? You know, we do that lots of ways. We have alerts, uh, we have these events, they tell us things, we go to training, we learn, uh, we study protocols so we understand how they behave. Well, now we're getting to this point where there's so much data, how do I quickly sift through what could be good and what could be bad? So there's lots of ways to do that. There are ways to look at data to make it more relevant to humans, and then there's ways to enhance that data so the human goes, ooh, I think that one's more important than the other one. So that's really where we wanted to sit. Okay, I'm almost done with my pontificating. That's the rough structure of the talk. We'll pontificate, nerd, and then pontificate, and then we'll be done. Um, all right, data enrichment. So, you know, it's not a great talk if you don't reference a dictionary. So uh, enrichment, improve or enhance the quality or value. I really like the bottom quote. Uh, I pulled it from a, a publication. And I highlighted the part about 
where appending or enhancing collected data with some relevant context obtained from an additional source. And it's the relevant part that really hit home for me. Um, when you're trying to make a decision for your environment, you need something that's relevant to your environment. So you can't just willy-nilly be dropping enrichment into your environment unless it has relevance. Because then, you know, who knows what kind of decisions you're going to make. All right, so in my research, I, I just thought this was valuable. A couple of common techniques for enriching data. So you can append. I'm just going to add stuff to it. Uh, you can segment. I'm going to take this kind of data and put it over here in this bucket because it tells me something here. And then I'm going to take another subset and I'm going to put it over here because that tells me something as well. Uh, gives me relevant context to those subsets. Uh, we're going to derive. Um, so maybe I have a really hard time reading epic timestamps. So I'm going to derive it into something I can understand, a standard date timestamp. Um, we'll manipulate. Uh, so maybe it's a chunk together user agent string, and I'm going to manipulate it and reparse it out so I can read each individual line. Uh, we'll extract, so maybe I'm just going to pull something out because uh, that specific piece, or categorize. Uh, so just some different ways to look at it. I'm going to pause here. So a couple of thoughts. These are my personal thoughts as I was reading the research and thinking about how I would want to implement it. So we've talked about context. That's really important. The context has to be relevant to your information environment. Um, or at least the area you're trying to make decisions. It should support the decisions. So let's not implement enrichment if it doesn't support a decision your organization actually has to make. Um, you're kind of wasting time and resources when you do that. Uh, so let's stay focused. Um, find ways to reduce swivel chair correlation. Uh, this one was always tough for me to watch. Uh, I'd have, say, an intelligence analyst looking at this cool report have an information security analyst looking at some events, and the only way they could correlate between the two is they would swivel their chairs and have a conversation and then swivel it back. Well, that, that takes forever. I'm glad they're socializing, though. That was always good. It was always good to see my team members speaking with each other, but let's speed this up a little bit. And then finally, think about your computational cost when you do this. Um, I'm going to show you some things. They're really, really cool, but it will have an impact. So as you implement these enrichment uh, opportunities, just think about that and think about where you might want to implement these and what technology so that you're not paying an immense cost. All right. Let's do some nerd things. Uh, I'll show you a cool new feature in 2.4. Uh, one of our developers built, and then we'll do some domain uh, name enriching with uh, parts of Elastic. All right, first one, DNS reverse lookups. This was a really cool feature that uh, one of our developers built, Corey uh, Ogburn. Uh, it was really, really awesome. He came on a call one day. I was off doing sales things. I jumped on the call, and he's showing this neat thing, and I was like, wow, that is actually really cool. You go simple configuration. It's not turned on by default, so this is a choice you need to make. Uh, essentially, what this feature does is um, in the browser, it's going to do a bunch of DNS reverse lookups to whatever DNS server your management interface is connected to. Uh, and then what it does, this is the part I like. You start getting these DNS names right there in SOC. So instead of looking at IPs, you're now actually getting human readable format that might provide that context. Now you have a known place where you can start to add that human readable content. So you get a lot more out of your DNS server. Now there's a cost. Your DNS reverse lookups are going to go up. <laughs> um, there is, actually, it didn't seem to impact the browser too much. The browser's really fast about this. Um, and then there's, some environments, there is a concern for operational security. So just think through which DNS server it's going to, what the uh, recursive lookups are on that DNS server. But th I still think it's a great opportunity to provide your analysts something human readable. So when they're looking at the IP, they can go, oh, that means something different to me now than it did before. All right, 
That just quick, easy win. I thought it was a great feature. I really thought it was cool. Um, all right, the next one. A couple of more steps in this. So what I would like to do is enrich my events with some threat intelligence. Um, and there's a whole lot of opportunity in Elastic now. And so let's leverage it and see what we can do with it. So in 2.4, we started using Elastic Agent. Uh, there are these things called Elastic Agent integrations, lots of ways to pull in different logs uh, from different services. And some of those services are threat intelligence services. Uh, we'll create an enrichment index, an enrich index. We'll create an enrich policy. Uh, and then finally, right at the end, you need an ingest pipeline to process it. And you get these cool um, appended events to your records. So in this particular case, it's going to be the DNS Zeek event. We're going to run it through an enrichment with abuse CH URL data. And you'll get this. And so now, as I'm looking at DNS records, I'll see a bunch of normal ones, and I can create a quick little dashboard and say, I just want to see the DNS records that have one of these enrichment embeds, because that's kind of interesting to me. So let's see how this goes. Here's the integrations uh, built into Elastic already. Uh, so they've got nine of them, these uh, threat intelligence integrations, the top four are already built in and supported in Security Onion 2.4.20. Um, and it's, it's those three, Abuse CH, MISP, Alien Vault OTX, and Recorded Future. Um, really, I chose Abuse CH because it's actually really easy to get up and running. So here it is. This is what it looks like when you click on one of those integration boxes. You get your little overview. This is the configuration, uh, pretty straightforward. That first block is populated by Elastic. It's a generic um, integration name. And there, the settings are pretty good by default. You can extend uh, how long it's looking, what the timeout is, some of those things. Those are relevant to your network. Then down at the bottom, you, you have to add this integration to a um, host policy, an agent policy. Uh, for my testing, I added it to SO Grid Nodes General. So that policy has all of the integrations that the Security Onion Grid is already using. So really, I'm just adding the threat intelligence integration to that policy. Pretty straightforward. You don't have to create anything else. Click a couple of boxes, and you're off. So what do you get? After a couple of minutes, it starts pulling down all the data from Abuse CH. And I just created a quick dashboard. Uh, so you're getting the URL, malware bazaar, and malware uh, threat intelligence records from abuse CDH, and really you're getting file and URL indicators out of it. Um, so not so bad. Uh, I think there's about 1,200 records in a 24-hour period. It wasn't bad. I, I didn't think it was too overwhelming uh, for the VM I was working in. All right, so now we have to create an enrich policy. And I've got two options up here. Option one, you do it from the command line. Option two, you can actually do this in the Kibana um, development tools console. Um, so I, I left them both up there. The second option is a little easier to read. <laughs> so I started there and then converted it into the command line, because then I could just copy paste that, and, and uh, it goes pretty quick. You use the SO Elasticsearch query. Uh, script and it's already got the credentials to put that um, configuration in. So what are we doing in the policy? Um, so you're going to tell it it's a match, you're looking for a match, um, and you're looking for it in a specific index. This is the part where you, you just got to know how Security Onion functions. So we're creating data streams, we're levering, leveraging data streams within Security Onion. And we're going to use the threat intelligence abuse CRH URL data stream. And that's what's created. You, you can see it in the record. If you open one of the records up, it'll tell you what index that record came from. Uh, so if you do Alienware, you can just open up a record and you'll see exactly what index it came from. Uh, we're matching a specific field. It's the threat indicator URL do domain. I chose that because I opened up one of the records and said, Oh yeah, it's this domain one that I want to match and enrich into my records. 
the fields that I want to be added or appended to the DNS query log for Zeek. Uh, so I just chose these. Um, you know, again, choosing information that's relevant to your environment. Uh, so this is what I chose. I wanted to just have the indicator type because I foresaw that I might want to build a neat dashboard for this someday. Um, the event.data set, because it's a good thing for me to filter on that URL domain, so I have it, and abuseCH has these cool um, tags, and that's what we saw, in the, and I'll review it when we go back to it. So you, you create the policy, post it up to uh, Elasticsearch, and then execute it. When you execute it, it creates an enrichment index. So I like to verify when I do things, so here's a quick, simple command. You can query the log, and uh, you, you get the little text of where it did get put, the enrichment policy was created. You can see where Elasticsearch went and pulled all of the data out of that base index, the threat intelligence index, and made its own enrichment index out of it to do the matching. So that made me feel good. I did it right. I know it, I, I'm more confident that it will work. All right, now more fun and adventure. Well, the last thing you need is an ingest pipeline so that uh, it actually processes the match and appends it to the, the Zeek event. Um, not super hard to create, uh, a little bit more command line kung fu. So we're going into uh, the local portion of salt stack uh, in salt, and we're adding a new ingest pipeline, and I just named it threat.enrich, it was a name I chose, and we create these processors. And I'll, I have another slide behind this that blows it up and makes it easier to read. This was the overview one. I, I was messing with both Alien Vault and Abuse CH, just playing with the different uh, threat intelligence platforms. But for me, it made sense to put all of these in one uh, pipeline so I could keep track of the different processors I had running. And I knew uh, they would all be in the same place. All right, here they're blown up. Um, so for DNS name query, the one we're really looking at, uh, you know, we're using the policy that we named, so you'll have to keep that policy name. Uh, the target field, I called it enrichment. So the field you append to the record is gonna start with enrichment, and then it adds the um, enrichment fields I had already selected. So event.dataset, the URL domain, the tags, all those get appended. And then finally, what are we matching on? So in the Zeek DNS records, I wanna match on DNS query name. So that's where that match happens. Elasticsearch is gonna be looking, it sees DNS query name, it takes that value, runs it against the enrich index, finds a match, appends the information to the record, and keeps on cruising. So this can happen, just, it's always chewing. The second one I have up here, I was playing with uh, the malware um, file information. Uh, this one's also pretty interesting. Uh, the abuse CH gives you all kinds of hashing options for these files. Uh, MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256, SSD. I mean, there was like five or six of them. Uh, unfortunately, as I understand it, you're gonna have to write one processor per hash type. Um, so, not so bad, cut and paste, change change the names to protect the innocent, um, but pretty neat. And it, it gives me a couple of different op, you know, I have more flexibility now. I can, enri I can enrich the Zeek records, I can enrich the Strelka records uh, that are coming in, and I can also enrich actual um, endpoint events from like Sysmon or Elastic Agent. Uh, the reason why I needed two of them is the field name's different. So, Strelka and Zeek use one field name and then the endpoint records use a different field name for MD5. So that's why there's two. Um, actually, it was really cool for me. It gave me a chance to dig around and actually take a hard look at how things are named. Uh, all right, restart Elasticsearch. Um, for the indexes that are already created for the day, you're gonna have to force this policy to be added. So it's a simple, um, configuration to make it the final pipeline for the ingest pipelines, and there you go, off to the races. So that's, I thought this was pretty useful. I get the URL tags, it tells me, you know, Abuse CH is keeping track of which campaigns these are tied to. 
Uh, I see it's a malware download, that's kind of important, that drives a decision for me, I don't feel great about that, I wanna pay attention to it. All right, so really fast, I, I didn't, um, I didn't wanna go too far into it, I just really wanted to stimulate this idea that we, we can do this now. Uh, we can start to add context to the data that we're bringing into Security Onion, and then we can use that context to drive decisions in our uh, organizations. Uh, we got a chance to really dig into how we do that in Security Onion. Uh, now we can start to implement it and have a conversation about what goes well and what doesn't go well and see where it takes us from here. And uh, I had a lot of fun building it, I, I really did. Uh, there were some not fun moments as I was beating my head against the wall trying to figure out why and then I had my aha moment and said, okay, this is how it works. Uh, and now that we got it working, I think it's, it's something that'll be really useful to the community um, and we can use it more. Um, I cruised through the slide. A lot of this came from something that Wes wrote a couple of years ago in 2.3 and uh, as we were rolling out 2.4, I said, you know what, I wanna try this again. And so thank you, Wes, that was phenomenal. Um, couple little changes for the new platform, but it's going really, really well. So thank you everyone uh, for listening. I try to keep it moving so that we could digest and prepare for the next talk. And uh, I think we got uh, some good time for a couple of questions. We can take another stretch break and keep the afternoon going. I didn't, uh, I looked, but I didn't really see it. And I was running this on a little VM, so I would have expected, you know, I kind of did that on purpose to see if it would, but no, I looked at the ingest pipeline times in uh, in Flux and it didn't seem so bad. I imagine, I only had a couple of processors running. I imagine if you had a long list of processors and if you were using multiple threat intelligence sources, it would start to get rough. Uh, I also think over time, because I really only ran it for a couple of days, I think if you had this running for months and your threat intelligence enrichment sources got pretty large, you would start to see more of it. Um, so it's, it, it's definitely something I'm gonna play with more to see when you start to bump into those problems. Um, but yeah, for this one, for something simple like that, it, it didn't seem to, to have much of a hit. Yeah. Ooh. I think the way I made that, no, we don't back up local. We do. Okay, so it does. Yes, it does. Uh, the stuff you put in Kibana. So when when I added the enrich policy to the configurations in Kibana. I don't think those, it lives where? Okay. So no, because it lives in the ES. Now, the notepad that I built it all in first, that gets backed up. <laughs> yeah, 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 to tape. <laughs> um, Josh. Yeah, um, I think Wes's article actually covers it because you can set the index life cycle and, and do it there. Um, yeah. I mean, it, um, some of the other ones is like MISP, when I was looking at MISP, you can actually tell it how far back to go at its first connection. Um, so you can limit it so it isn't going back five years um, unless when I was in the DOD, we would totally pull it all in and try to do it all because that's how we roll. Okay, any other questions? All right, fantastic. Thank you for the time. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah.